Good morning, all. I wanted to read that first verse again because it was it's just really uh, neat. Uh, day by day, with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems lovingly, uh, best lovingly. It's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. I don't know why. That just struck me as um, a good thing to remember how the Lord brings um, all things into our life, whether it's uh, pleasant at the time um, or whether it's difficult. Uh, we all know the, uh, the realities of difficulties in our life. We all go through different things at different times. We all know the, um, the wonders of pleasant things that God brings into our life as well. So just to remember that he's God and, and is sovereign in all those circumstances. And it kind of um, feeds into our lesson for today in Deuteronomy. So um, today's lesson may be kind of hard. Um, we get to a part of Deuteronomy that is, uh, it's, it's past the, like the, the big middle section of Deuteronomy has been um, a kind of a reiteration of the Ten Commandments and an application of those in our lives. Um, from chapters, I think, 12 to 26, it's just been a lot of um, cases where um, living in, in God's commands would be uh, played out and what that would look like in life. Um, <clears throat> and since we're getting toward the end of Deuteronomy, I want to make sure that um, we all have kind of a big picture of what, what's going on in Deuteronomy. I don't know if, if, if you feel like you've gotten a handle on it, if things are sticking out or if it's still kind of murky. Um, but for me, I like to think of it in a couple different chunks. Um, if you remember the first maybe four chapters were about Israel's history. It was kind of their uh, remembering how they'd been redeemed out of Egypt, how God had preserved them uh, in the wilderness. And now they were standing on the edge of the promised land. Um, and they were faced with that decision, would they uh, trust God, would they obey him, uh, um, unlike Israel had done 40 years earlier. Remember, they had that chance to enter the land earlier and didn't trust in the Lord. So that's kind of the first part is the history. Then we get to the second section, which is the, the Ten Commandments and the greatest commandment, and some general ideas about the law and um, Israel's place before the Lord. Then that big middle section that we've just gone through, the, the stipulations of the, of the law, of the covenant. That was chapters 12 to 26. Now today we're in a section in chapters 27 and 28, which are the blessing and the curses of the law. Um, so if you remember, uh, blessing and curses were part of covenants. Um, when you think about a covenant, what, what all is included in a covenant? When you, you know, a covenant would be kind of an, a, an agreement between uh, two parties, but what's included in the covenant? What are some, some of the points that you would look for, the content, the information that you'd see in a covenant? Scott, I saw your... Okay. Are you saying what Greg said? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Very good. Yep. So the, the terms and conditions would be there. Who the parties are. Who'd, um, yeah. You'd start off with who's in the covenant. What else? Generally, what the Sioux run has done to the Jubilee uh, Valley. Okay. Yeah. And there, were, there would be covenants that could be made between, that would be made between peers, um, but also covenants that would be made between uh, one who's clearly in authority and power. Um, that's what John's talking about is a, a suzerain or a, a, like a king who would conquer a territory. And then he'd make a covenant with everybody in the, in the land. <clears throat> Anything else in a covenant? Remember? Maybe. Uh, Tell me, sir, what happens when you break it? 
All right, good. We have um, all of our um, anonymous, or not so anonymous anymore. That's right. It's the what happens when you break it, um, and, or what happens when you keep it. And that's kind of what we're talking about today is what are the blessings that come from obedience to the covenant, and what are the curses that result from uh, not obeying uh, the covenant. Um, and so what we're seeing today is that um, that part of the covenant coming into view of the, the blessings and the curses of the covenant that God has made with Israel. Um, what blessing would they see from God if they obey the covenant? And what curses would they see from God if they didn't obey the covenant? Okay. Um, okay, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 27. Uh, <clears throat> can someone read 27, verse 12 and 13? Let me mark this up here. Of Deuteronomy. When you have crossed all over the Jordan, he shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Ben, and Naphtali. Okay, so here's the scene. Um, if you could see a topographical map of Israel, you'd, well, you'd see mountains all over the place, but there are these two mountains that are next to each other. You got Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And so, um, and this is not the first time we've heard of these two mountains. Back in chapter 11, we saw, um, this is 11.29, I'll just read. It says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Um, you might, at least the picture I have in my head is that old, um, is it a Super Bowl commercial where they're, it's a taste great, less filling. Remember that one? No? Okay. You might think of people on each side of the mountain like shouting across to each other, but that's not really what's going on. Um, if you go to Joshua, you know, Joshua is, they've entered the land and it's, um, it's talking about how they've gone to Mount Gerizim and Ebal to carry out uh, what they've been commanded. They're really standing in front of these two mountains. As uh, Joshua says, um, um, at that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord. This is Joshua chapter 8. Uh, he built an altar to the Lord on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant, the Lord, servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel. Um, and the people stood um, opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim, and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as they'd been commanded. And then they recited uh, the blessing and the curse according to all that is written in the book of the law. So if you could imagine there's kind of a, um, if this is uh, one of the mountains, I can't remember which is on the north. Anybody has a... Ebal. Thank you. And Gerizim. With a, kind of a valley run between them. There's a city down here. You've heard of Shechem. I'm not going to spell this right. It looks like that. All right. That's my English eyes. Um, so anyway, they're, they're kind of in this valley standing near Shechem and uh, portraying or and, and proclaiming these blessings and the curses. Um, I can't remember which one's north and south always, but I do remember which one's the blessing and the curse mountain. You guys remember how or know how? Um, I always think of um, E is the evil and G is good. So, um, so if nothing else, you remember um, which mountain was which. Um, so the question is, um, what are these blessings and what are the curses? You know, what is it that would happen to them 
when they obeyed the covenant and what would happen to them when they did not obey the covenant. So the first thing we're going to do is spend some time reading some of uh, this section and seeing what parts of life does it touch? You know, what, what spheres of their lives would these blessings and curses um, have bearing on? So to start off, um, we're going to look in 28 from 1 to 6. Okay, can someone read Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 6? And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commands that I commanded you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And if these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, if you will obey the voice of the Lord your God, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds, and the young of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Okay. And it doesn't stop there. You know, we keep reading in verse 7 all the way down to 14. Um, this consistent blessing that would result from their obedience. What areas of their life was the blessing affecting? What was, what about their, you know, what spheres of, of their lives was that influencing? Their physical welfare. Okay. Um, Part of it would they be healthy, and uh, what else would that affect their in their physical lives? Children. Their children, their families, families uh huh. Their harvest, uh huh. Would they be enemies? Yeah. If you kept reading, there'd be uh, uh, safety from enemies. They'd be seen as the head, not the tail. Um, pretty much every part is. Blessed in every aspect of all kinds of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Every part of their life, they'd see a uh, blessing. Um, do you see anything else in there that uh, you'd want to highlight? Maybe if you scan down from verse 7 to 14, things that might stick out? Well, not the physical way, I suffer in the Old Testament. Okay. Um, the people who would see them being blessed by the Lord would hear them. Okay. It's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? That they'd be a separate people? Mm -hmm. What verse is that in, John? Okay. Yeah. So, a um, lot of blessing, right? A lot of uh, ways that God would be with them, and they would see evidence of that uh, in their lives, whether it's from the abundance in their crops to abundance in their families to abundance in um, you know success in warfare and even the there's just all the nations having a respect for them and a fear for them and uh, seeing that um, I think that's even to draw attention to God in a way that when other people would see what was happening in Israel okay um, let's move on to the curses um, to start, just start in verse 15 and then your eyes kind of scan down and see um, what areas of life are the curses to affect. Would you say they're pretty synonymous with the blessings? Yeah, it's every area, right? It's all the way from their crops to their kids to their 
def being defeated. Um, yeah, it's in some ways it's it's the loss of the blessing, right? It's it's the lack of what could have been if they had obeyed the Lord. Um, you could even say it's the removal of what had been promised to them, you know, as a result of their uh, being faithful, if they were faithful. Okay, so now we're going to start reading this section. And I don't know if you've read chapter uh, 28 before, but it's a hard chapter to read. So let's start with um, 28, uh, verses 20 to 24, and kind of just let these, um, this, these scenarios roll over you as you think about um, what would happen as a result of their disobedience. Uh, can someone read uh, from 20 to 24? Stand on the encouragement, the approval, and the rebuke, and everything which you show the wicked, and so you are destroyed, and you come to sudden ruin because of the evil you have done and forsaken me. The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land you are entering to possess. The Lord will strike you with aches and disease, with fever and inflammation, with sorcery leaves and drought, with blight and mildew which will plague you until you perish. The sky over the land will be gone, the ground beneath you burn. The Lord will turn the grain of your country into dust and ash. It will come down from the sky and kill the inhabitants. Okay. Is that enough? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so put your hand there and turn the page if you have to and see where the chapter goes. Um, it's there's a lot. In fact, if someone can just read a little bit more from uh, 25 to 28, just to try to get a sense of the um, the scope of the curse. Um, yeah, can someone start in 25, Mike? The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. You shall be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And your dead body shall be food for all birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth. And there shall be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egyptian and tumors and scabs and hurts, of which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and beasts of fire. Okay. Is that enough to read? <laughs> um, yeah, like I said, this is a, it's a hard section to read because it's just, it's wave upon wave of disaster for them um, in every part of life. Um, so one question I had was, um, think about the, the place of the blessing and the curses in the covenant. Um, why would there be blessings and curses when it came to their obedience or disobedience? What, um, I don't know the best way to say it, but what is, what is the role of these? What's the role of the blessing and cursing um, in God's relationship to Israel? To encourage obedience and discourage disobedience. Okay, that's very succinctly and perfectly said. <laughs> Um, to encourage obedience and discourage disobedience. Um, so anybody want to take that and expand on it? Ms. Scott? Um, well, for me, I, I, I always like emphasize, I guess, that they're also typologically showing the blessings and cursings of an eternal relationship. Okay, so it may be, uh, like you said earlier, these are all pertaining to their, to their physical well-being, but they may be pointing to something even more. Yes. Okay. Uh, John? The, uh, if you go to the uh, suzerain king, it was to strike fear into the hearts of, 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 the, of the servants when you, when you hear the curses. Hmm. They would demand obedience. I mean, they were strict obedience. 
Now, Mayor Klein maintained that that uh, the student wing came, came first, and then then uh, Moses. I think it was. This, I think it's it's the way we react and act. I think we do exactly the same thing. We tell our children, you know, I put a roof over your house, put clothing on your back, I give you food. These are the things I've done for you. This is what I expect of you in obedience. Uh, it doesn't really strike fear in some kids at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Mike, you had your hand up. Um, his, the, the commands to obey were in their best interest and led to, would lead to the, the greatest um, experience of life. And coupled with that are all the blessings. But if they choose to disobey, they're choosing against what is best for them, and they will get what is worst for them. Mm -hmm. and, and they were made aware of this in advance so that to kind of to try to curb them from choosing badly. Mm -hmm. But as we all know, they and we often choose badly. Okay. Against what is best for us. Yeah. So um, I know the answer is because of our sin, but why do we sometimes still choose to disobey God knowing that there is no good outcome for it? Well, I think a lot of it's what separated you and before you were born. That when okay. the, the result of both of these things is to establish that God is sovereign and is holy. And to the degree that we recognize God as holy, as a number of people said, uh, we're, we're just going to be uh, glorifying God in our obedience. And we're going to be, in, in some sense, even if we're punished, we're going to choose to glorify God hmm. either way. Mm -hmm. Good. May I else have their hand up over there? You can't, you can't rub your chin, otherwise I think you're, uh, I'm gonna, yeah, oh, you did, okay. I, in listening to Mike in particular, I was thinking this is really about God's protection and his love over them and us, because he knows what's best for us, and so in his love and kindness, he commands us to do what Steve said glorifies him the most. Hmm and what brings us the most good mm -hmm. yeah and i i was thinking that those are really good answers i appreciate you um, bringing those up um i was also thinking about just the way that sin entices us mm -hmm. right um we all know that sin never says you know you can sin but it's going to turn out bad for you like sin never makes that promise to us, right? Sin always says, it's not that bad. Did God really command you not to? Um, this is actually for your own good anyway. You should go ahead and do it. And I think that um, seeing that sin makes those kinds of enticements and our, our sinful hearts are drawn to them, I think even more so, we need to, to hear over and over the horrific outcome of yeah. sin. And I think, you know, when you compare even the, the amount, <clears throat> the number of verses about blessing was, I think it's like 15, and the number of verses about curses is the whole rest. It's, yeah, it's a lot more. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily because, I don't think it's because God is a killjoy or wants to people to feel like, you know, lowly and, and th that kind of thing, but just to remind them of the reality of the horrifying consequences of sin. Like, don't forget that um, horrible things come upon us when we don't obey the Lord, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If Adam didn't listen, why should we? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Mm -hmm. You know, we why should we choose that one thing that is good, even twice? I mean, the, the disobedience from our own part. I don't think we really 
know or have begun to understand the depth of our poverty in our own souls. And Adam didn't have that poverty. And without that poverty, he still chose that one thing that was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Brett, you had your hand up. But as far as negative consequences, of course, thinking about is this just God being harsh to get his arbitrary desire, or is it the logical, is there a logical connection between the bad outcome and the sin? I would say the latter, obviously. Mm-hmm. It's not just him being harsh like a, a man a, a dictator on earth. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get at earlier. It's not just God wants to have his way because he's just, you know, capricious that way and wants to punish people that don't. Are you, are you saying Sin itself is the bad outcome, or is the bad outcome the consequence of it? I'm saying it's connected because the sin itself is evil, and it leads to evil consequences. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the point of that verse of Romans 16? Do you know what he was getting to that verse? Or are you getting the point? That was a Puritan title, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't know for sure. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot we could, um, that even brings up um, Romans 1, how <clears throat> their sin is even a consequence of their sins. Like, you know, that, that even more um, bent comes on them because of their choosing away from the Lord. But it's not really where I want to go, but yeah, there's just a lot um, there. Um, in in a Deuteronomy 28.46, if you could, if you're there, you can look, but it's just, we're seeing how the curse is to be a reminder to them. Um, It says, uh, um, these curses shall be a a sign and a wonder against you and your offspring forever, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, because of the abundance of all things. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a weird thing in my throat. Um, so you, you think about the, the curses of the covenant not really being understood, but also do we understand the blessing of the covenant? Do we, do we really grasp the blessing that comes into our life when God's smile is on us because of we're walking in his ways? Um, I think we all know those differences of the the internal pleasure we have as God's children when we're walking with him, when we when our fellowship with him is closer, uh, when we're seeing his goodness, uh, seeing his presence um, um, in that way, rather than the absence of it, right? Um, so I think it's important too for us to to really grasp the blessing that comes um, from obeying the Lord, and to let that be a reminder to us that it's not in vain that we would want to follow Him. It's not in vain that we would you know try to put to death the deeds of the flesh so that we might live. You know to really grab hold of the life that He has for us. And obviously, this is not uh, we're not talking about a prosperity gospel. I don't think any of you would be going that direction, but this is not not saying that the life of a Christian is just full of blessing and goodness, and we just need to claim that you know promise that God has for us, um, because we know that life is is difficult, um, it's challenging, and uh, I want to get to that more in a little bit, but just to to briefly remind us here that it's not about just all of life becomes good and pleasant when we follow him. Um, Okay. Um, Any thoughts or questions at this point? No. All right. Looks like you're going to. Okay. So here's another question then. Um, And I'm I'm asking these questions because this is where my my mind was going. Are the blessings and cursings, uh, curses, um, a natural consequence of our actions, or are they by divine will? (laughs) 
Anybody want to to be more decisive than Kathy has been? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, let's let's look at um, at some verses here. This is, it's always a good place to start. So look at uh, twenty eight seven through nine. Um, we stopped reading just before this, but can someone read uh, verses seven through nine? Of 28. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God has given you. The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself, as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Okay. So I'll ask another, another way. Is God passive in this verse, these verses, or is he active in these verses? Quite active. Very active, right? Um, he's very much at the the origins of the blessing, you know, he's behind them, he's causing them. He says, the Lord will command the blessing on you and your barns and all that you undertake. Um, let's also look at um, whether God is passive or active in the curses. Okay. Uh, can someone read 28? 68 to 60. I think I got this right. Yeah. If you do not carefully follow all the words of this law, which are written in this book, and do not revere this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, the Lord will send fearful plagues on you and your descendants, harsh and prolonged disasters and severe and lingering illnesses. He will bring upon you all the diseases of Egypt that you dreaded, and they will cling to you. Is that how many? How many uh, through 30? Or I'm sorry, through 60? I did do 60. Okay. Oh, he will, yeah. Uh, yeah, I read. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, so I guess back to the first question about natural consequences versus God's active will. Um, I think if I pressed you more on what you mean by natural consequences, you would say that God's still behind them. I think you would say that, right? Would anybody argue otherwise? Kathy, you want to argue otherwise? No. Nope. All right. I think so. I think yeah. <laughs> so even you know you might read through Proverbs. Proverbs is a, is um, not direct promises that God makes to us. They're they're principles of how life works but they're how life works in God's world. Mm -hmm. This is what he has ordained the way um, our lives are to work, right? So even if we think of things being natural consequences, you know, we see that all the time, right? People make a bad decision, um, turns out bad for them. Hopefully they learn from that, but ultimately that's God's ordained um, way that life is working for us, right? Um, so ultimately, uh, we want to see that God's behind it. But in Deuteronomy, there's nothing about natural consequences. It's all directly. God is doing these things. God is commanding the blessing. God is bringing about the curse on you. He's very active and forefront in the way that the blessing and the curses are, are being carried out. Um, does that make sense? Is that... Difficult, Scott, you had your first and then Wendy? Always. Wendy first then? I have a question that probably doesn't have an answer. So I think when we were talking about corporate versus individual, like when we look at the individual, like, you know, that's the Bible says when you get pregnant, that's the, you know, so God is in control, yes. But now we're talking about corporate, right? So we're talking about the body of Christ, the community, the people of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the group, the group of people that he's talking to. And so, like, I, I'm sure that, you know, in that group, I mean, we've got this, you know, we've got Achan sin, right? There's only one person that steps out of the Jericho, and 
everybody was punished for it for when you did it at events in school. I mean, like, I, I guess my question is just that, like, like in that group of people, I just it's hard to believe that every single one of them was on, you know, a path of righteousness. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. how does this play out in that? I guess. Yeah, there was a. Let's just get to the point. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, there was a verse. I think it was last week that either we read or at least I had thought about talking about was um, saying that the the curse that came from sin would apply to it be to you it wouldn't be because of your dad's or because of your sin and I think we see that also is that in Ezekiel maybe um, so it's not that there's it's not that there's no longer corporate sin but it's also um, you you're able to obey the Lord um, as he's working in in your life as well um, I wish that I had um, included this um, because some people look at the blessings and the cursings in, in this chapter that we're in now, and they're saying that some of these are more for individual and some of them are more for the whole. Um, I'm not answering your question. I'm kind of like talking all around it, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, keep that in mind though, because it is gonna come up I, again here in a minute. How about one more comment and then we need to go on. Um, John? Well, the Isaiah puts it this way with reference to sin in Isaiah 45. For my sakes, my, my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it from you that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you in the amount of silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake for my own sake i do it but how shall my name be profaned my glory i will not give to another hmm. okay good um let me um read a verse in uh in deuteronomy 28 that it may be one of the hardest ones for people to hear um deuteronomy 28 verse 63 says as the and as the Lord took delight in doing you good and multiplying you, so the Lord will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you. Um, you know, I bring this up because it, it's a hard verse, and I think maybe you've you've heard it before or seen it, but certainly as you're reading through it, it sticks out. It's hard for us to to see, and just a, a maybe a couple words about it is. Um, one, I think we need to quickly remember that God's not delighting in the ruin itself. Uh, we go to Ezekiel 33, and it says, um, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? God doesn't take pleasure in the death itself, okay? So I want to maybe clarify that it's not that he's looking for someone to mess up and then saying, yeah, finally get to, to bring the curse on somebody. Um, so that's one thing I, I think we need to remember about that verse. Um, but another one, um, this is, it's another huge topic, uh, but we also want to remember that um, we see in scripture this, this idea that um, hard times or difficulties in life aren't always tied directly to sin, to um, that person's sin, right? Um, we see, um, uh, nor is a person's righteousness always directly tied directly to blessing in their life, right? We see in the Psalms uh, many times when they're crying out, you know, how long will the wicked prevail? They just keep going on living like, like there's no God and they don't seem to have any accountability for it. Or similarly, God, I've been righteous before you. I've, you know, of course they're not saying that they're, they've earned 
justification before the Lord, but they've walked in his ways and yet their enemies are prevailing over them. Why am I still in hiding when I haven't done anything wrong? You look at Job's life. Um, it's a very clear case where he's declared as a righteous man and yet all the disaster comes on him without him knowing why. That's, that's his big um, uh, trial, right? Is why are these things happening to me? That's the plea that he has uh, with the Lord. Um, Psalm 94 says, O Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? Um, and then also from Ecclesiastes 7, um, it says, In my vain life I've seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. So those two things are, I think, are helpful in understanding that verse about um, God's um, execution, um, his executive power, I guess, in bringing about the, the curse on uh, the evildoer. And I think uh, the, what I take to be the point here from this passage is kind of what you said, Steve, earlier, is that, that God is sovereign over um, all who are in his covenant, that it's not just he kind of knows how things work, so I'm going to set up some rules and let, you know, kind of let the chips fall. God's very active in his blessing and in his uh, curses um, of those within his covenant. Um, does that make sense, Taylor? It just makes me think of like knowing my enemies, knowing God, and keeping your enemies in study and like the very attributes of God and like it's bringing back to memory, you know, the holiness of God or God the judge or the wrath, wrath of God, of God. Yeah. and especially the wrath of God mm -hmm. because it was really eye opening when you hear wrath, you think our wrath, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is unrighteous wrath. <laughs> you know, an anger and a hatred in the sense of, um, you know, simple, selfish desire for evil, but, but, you know, the wrath of God is something so very different, mm -hmm. and, and to me, this verse is, is making me think about his attributes of holiness, um, that he, he can't abide right. sin, so he mm -hmm. takes delight in, in, in the destruction would be the upholding mm -hmm. of his righteousness and holiness not a pleasure mm -hmm. in in seeing things destroyed but um you know the the righteous expectation against sin mm -hmm. you know it's it's to me it's just it's it's accentuating his holiness mm -hmm. and who he is mm -hmm. yeah very well said um yeah, and I actually want to slow down here a little bit because we're we are actually getting toward the end, and just kind of soak in the couple things that hopefully we've seen today. Um, one, I think it's important for us to really um, to see that uh, the the covenants that God's made with people in 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 history have included these blessings and curses. I, um, we might think of you know, that's just um, maybe isolated to his dealings with, with um, Israel, that if they followed his law, you know, blessings are cursing. But I think, you know, if we want to see um, that a covenant can describe in a big picture how God is relating to humanity as a whole, all through history, and that there's blessing and cursing involved with that relationship that he has with humanity, um, and then to see that even, um, even God's salvation that he's given to us is within this covenant structure, this idea of covenant, okay? Um, and, um, and more to come on that in a minute, but the second thing is just to see the, the um, activity of God in in bringing about those, that blessing and, and curses in the covenant. Okay, so those are two things I hope we can remember is that covenants have those two things and that God's very active in, in bringing them about. But where I wanna end is thinking about us now in the new covenant. Um, I think if, as we see even the new covenant having this idea of blessing 
and cursing. Um, and what I wanna, where I wanna go with this is looking at where is the, the curses um, applied in the new covenant and where are the blessings applied in the new covenant? Um, because God's relationship to us still stands, right? It's still, um, it's still within this covenant framework. But um, I'm having trouble getting there. So if you guys ask questions, you can, you can say that or ask questions. But what, let me go to Galatians 3 real quick, because this is, um, it's starting to, I'm trying to, to land on something in, that Galatians is bringing out. Galatians 3.10 says, um, all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. That's actually a quote from Deuteronomy that we just um, uh, would have seen in, I think it's chapter 27. Okay. Oh yeah, 27 verse 26. And the problem that, that Paul's addressing here in Galatians is that no one's been able to keep that law. So we're all under a curse because we're not able to keep the conditions of the covenant, the stipulations, the law that God's made. And so what, what should happen when we don't obey the stipulations of the covenant? The curse would come, right? That's why we're, we would be under the curse. However, um, if you if you jump down to verse 13, yep. it says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Okay. Um, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So what I want us to see is that... Um, I want us to see salvation as a working out of this covenant where on one hand, um, Israel and we are not able to keep that law that God's given. And so we're under a curse. But we know that Jesus kept the law perfectly, right? So what should happen to Jesus if he's kept the law perfectly. It would be blessing to him. And yet, what do we receive? And what did Christ take on? Mm -hmm. To see that um, in this covenant uh, relationship, even though Jesus was perfectly righteous, he perfectly obeyed all of the law, he didn't take the blessing, he took the curse that we deserved. Um, that's something that, you know, hopefully we hear a lot. Hopefully we hear that in the, um, in the, I know we hear it in the preaching, but I just want us to really remember um, the, the idea of the of covenant that's behind that, that, that it's really this, this, the covenant playing out um, in the, in the life of, that Jesus has lived and the life that he's given to us. And so um, maybe just to accentuate that with one minute, if we read through all of Deuteronomy 28, um, it would be it would be a hard day, to be honest. Um, we only read a portion of it. And to see how disastrous that was for them in every part of their life. And yet, as Scott said, that was just the temporal life that they were talking about to see that Jesus took on the curse, not only of a temporal life, it wasn't just being crucified that was the, the curse. There were thousands of people that were, cru that were crucified at the time. Um, but he took on the curse of being separated from God, that, that God's holy wrath was poured out completely and fully on him, um, that we would not have to experience that eternal curse um, but instead we can experience the eternal blessing. So I'm sorry I went over, but I hope that that's just, um, just helping you think through um, the, the fullness of what a covenant is and what's involved in 
uh, God's work of salvation for us. So with that, let's uh, close in prayer. Uh, Father God, we uh, praise you and we give glory to you that you um, are so wise in the way that you have established um, salvation. Help us to be humbled, Lord. Help us to be thankful that our hearts would want to obey you out of humility and thankfulness of what you've done for us. Um, and that you're a God who um, has eternal blessing for us as we uh, live for you and as we look forward to that day of seeing your face um, in eternity. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.